hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Chaluminati podcast, episode 92. I'm almost positive. You're almost right. 100%. It is. Yeah, yeah. That's sweet. Perfect. As always, I'm wondering how it's like Martin Jordan. Two. Things. I know. We're going to be at 100 like really I soon, dude. I can't believe we've been doing this show that long. There's not many things I've done 92 episodes of. I'll put it that way. We're in, uh, we're on year three, Jesse. Really? Yes. <laughs> I find that hard to believe. 2018 okay. February was our first episode. Really? That's unbelievable. Yeah. What's wrong with so you people? I know. It's nuts. I thought for um, sure this would have petered out after episode six or seven. <laughs> yeah, I'm assuming you jumped in on this and just like, this sounds uh, novel like, and yeah, entertaining. I mean, have fun for a little bit. Here we are. <laughs> And it would have yeah. if it wasn't for Chaluminati Pod at Patreon.com, where you Oof. can keep Oof. us uploading episodes every single week from now <laughs> until not just three years, but till eternity. And that is eternity, whether or not you believe that our brains are going to be digitized into a computer or put into some sort of alternate soul state and carried on in in a in some sort of other are you realm saying are you saying if there's a version of of heaven out there for whatever religion we'll still take heaven, your heaven bucks is that what you're if saying you yeah. got <laughs> heaven bucks to spare <laughs> send them to patreon.com slash chaluminati pod there's a discord there's posters there's ad free episodes there's the 15 minute extra bonus mini sods that you guys love to see you know, I got a crazy one I'm going to talk about today. Some of you guys are going to call me an asshole who's crazy for suggesting is true. Oh. Ooh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm now nervous about I'm ready whether to. <laughs> I'm ready yeah, to do, do we it. Need, do we need to censor this? No, I'm uh, not going to get canceled today. But if you want to find out what I'm talking about, head over to patreon.com slash Chaluminati pod today please please do and also we're almost at eight thousand. you push us over that and we're under a hundred from a thousand patrons that would be awesome if we could do that so the road over. to a thousand you guys the road to it th- we're here the road to a thousand finally uh honestly i don't know why i took that from your hands alex this is a day dedicated to you guys i gotta tell you i'm honored to bring this story to you i've what sometimes- an asshole <laughs> oh, is this too, too early? Canceled. Yeah, we're not in the no. mini yet. Oh, we're not. Oh, not no, is, that's the mini Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. I am. I am my, so my honored. I am so honored about this story because this is one of those ones where you find it and then you go, oh, this is going to be a good one. Like this is one where I didn't have to like bull, make any bullshit up to make it interesting. This is a great this is a great one. I've been wanting to do it for a little bit of time, but I decided to hold off for a very specific reason. Now that it's here, I'm very excited because I'm pretty sure a lot of people haven't heard about this one before. And it's kind of just like its own neat little paranormal tale. I could see there being a movie about this with this premise. Right. OK, this uh, is this is a hell of a buildup, Alex. I have to give it to you. I'm just it's it's just great. Like, OK. Here's here's how this whole thing started. Like a month or two ago, Jesse and I played through a game over on Scary Game Squad with Gerard and Davis from Coconut Grove. Uh, And that game was called Little Hope, uh, by the way. And by the end, uh, I wasn't the biggest fan of the actual game, but I got really caught up in the like major paranormal mechanic of the story, which was like characters from the modern world, like sort of like. Having like not quite visions, not quite time travel moments with like characters from hundreds of years ago in this like Salem-esque witch trial type area. And uh, while spoilers for the game, it turned out that none of that was real and it was just a crazy ass bus driver working out his family fire (laughs) grief. Uh, Something about it stuck with me because I, I it felt familiar to me, you know, and as you know, I stay up late all the time uh, watching weird videos all uh, online and and just sort of like vibing out to like whatever weird things the algorithm sends my way. And as it happens, playing through Little Hope, like shook loose this memory of me in my dorm room in the early 20s. And I spent like a week or two looking for this video because I could. What? It, it was this memory that in I had early, of seeing. Uh, you mean the early 2000s? What? I mean, I think he, early 20s, my like 20s. his age. My oh, 20s. I thought you meant like the wait, roaring are you 20s. Us, are you about to tell us the whole premise of today's episode is I was alive in 1920. I remembered that I was, I was alive like, oh, in the oh, prohibition. Oh, my mind. 
And I might also call you an asshole for that, for keeping that secret for yeah, so long. I'm like, how dare you keep a <laughs> time traveler? Can you imagine if 92 episodes in, I just revealed that I had like one of those, like, I am paranormal myself. You were, you were the Highlander. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've been alive for a thousand years. If that, if that's what you dropped on us, I'd be like, that's just oh, unfair. Man. That's just if not you the even Highlander, unfair. Though, you, you wouldn't, hopefully you wouldn't have to be behead your other ones. You just like. You guys sit down, we try just, to smoke just, each other out. Yeah, by the time the joint is done, the other one of me has just disappeared and I've absorbed him again. Uh, right. No, but uh, <laughs> it, it was just a video that I watched like 10 years ago or something that had like a similar sort of like mechanic. And I was like, what the fuck was that? And I looked for it for weeks and I finally found it. And it was an episode of a show you probably have not heard of, but you may have heard of, uh, which I love. And it's kind of like a 90s mix between unsolved mysteries and ghost adventures. Uh, and it's from the UK and it was called Out of This World. And it was hosted by Carol Vorderman uh, from Countdown. And uh, so I found that episode of that show that I was looking for. And then after that, I went on a sort of journey to try and find this book that was written by the people from the episode who this happened to. Uh, but apparently a podcast did an episode on this or something one time. And now the books are like 600 to a thousand dollars, $2,000. So fuck that. I shit. one day wish to wield such power. Well, dude, to like, be able to mention a book and to make the prices of such rare ones. The Illuminati bump. Dude, right, that's that what happened with uh, Boston Baked out of, Beans. For out of print books. <laughs> that's what I want. We, we got to get that brand deal with the Boston Baked Bean Company. Dude, oh, that'd be so sick. Bring them back in the like in the Real fold. baked beans or that crappy candy? That the, really awful candy. Yeah, the very bad no, candy. No, the candy's pretty good. I like the candy. The candy's you're just, okay. You're shill. You Boston Baked Bean shill. <laughs> no, He's the Boston those Baked Bean boy. Mary Janes are also <laughs> great candies. Are you serious? <laughs> Have you ever had a Mary Jane? Are you literally telling me that you, they're your two favorite candies are the Boston baked beans and Mary Jane's? I wouldn't say. Okay, so I wouldn't say the Boston baked bean is one of my favorite candies, but I enjoy it. The Ma Mary Jane is an Abba really Zabba. up there, top like, five. Is this a weed joke? Are we? What is happening? Mary Jane? What? Man, you've never heard? Of, am I crazy and thinking that's the? Oh my god, am I wrong in the candy name? No, you're absolutely Mary. right. They're just. Thank I you. don't think that they're good candies. Is this they like? Are good are, is this like some like old timey like? Yes, Circus. definitely an old yes. person they're candy. All, it's all, like a car it's like a hard caramelly type like you know, taffy honestly, type. sounds right to, up my alley. You know how if you go to a uh, 7-Eleven or some sort of gas station, you go down that candy aisle and you have all the name brand candies right on like at eye level. And if you look right down near <laughs> the floor, where the good stuff is, there's all those candies where it's like lemon, the blue sharks, all those. the peach yeah, rings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, all that stuff down there. That's where you find these down at the okay. very bottom. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Legacy candies, we call them grandfathered in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Usually anyway, licorice flavored. <laughs> Some sort of Ennis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mary Jane's. Right. Right. Uh, I thought that was oh a shoe. God. I thought that was a shoe. I don't know. I'm tripping out. Uh, <laughs> anyway, there was supposed to be a Kindle version of this book that was out for like five pound 50 is the only price point that I found for it anywhere. But if there ever was that it is gone now, does not exist. I so if anybody want to jump in, Alex, they there is a shoe called Mary Jane's. Okay. It's, a, it's a it's a variety of shoe. Yeah. Then I'm at least somewhere in my brain is working. Like somebody was made happy by what I said. Uh, now I'm not sure that Mathis knows what he's talking about. Yeah, I, no. The, Mary Jane's candy is just Bitto honey. Is what it is. Bitto honey's also yeah, same thing. Yeah. Mary Jane's I is like called it Bitto honey. Is like that's the kind that your grandma makes in her kitchen after church kind of deal. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Mary Jane's candy. It even looks like it's from 1922. I know bit of it's honeys. So, yeah, but they got it right the first time. Bit you of honeys I mean? are all right. I like them. Okay. I love them. Oh, I kind of want a bag now. I'm sure you can find them at your local <laughs> ghost uh, haunted house. Uh, <laughs> shout out to oldtimecandy.com. There, they have all the old time uh, candies. A very I, valuable website. I went to go look and see if they had any Mary Janes in stock. All the Mary Janes, all of them out of stock. However, that's what I'm saying. However, they do have. A lot of candy cigarettes. Like, hey, if you can get oh a box God. of 24 candy packs cigarettes of candy are so cigarettes. Gross. <laughs> Do they have the gum ones? The really bad yes. gum ones? Yes. Ugh. With the chalky? Oh, All right. yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, so I couldn't find the book. So I had to base this version of the story, not just off the TV episode, but also like a bunch of different like blogs and online summaries uh, that told their sort of like summaries of 
the story told in the book. And some of those have quotes. So I've got all the stuff that I would normally have. Uh, but I'll give you the links for those in the subreddit after the fact, uh, as well as I used a much shorter version of the story, which I found in another book, which was an anthology called Haunted Cheshire by Tom Slemon. Uh, but uh, that's all I got on background. Now it's time to settle oh, okay. in kick back, relax for story time. Mathis and Jesse, make sure you got some micro chips and dip on hand, if you will. I wish I did have food. I'm so hungry now uh, that we talked about candy. Because today we're jumping into the world of early personal computing, okay? So I want you to, that's how I'm going to introduce this story. It's it's a bit With, with a good microchip joke? A little, I like, a little I like microchip it. joke like for it. you guys? A little preschool yeah, style joke? You. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, but first, let's talk about the first character we need to meet in our story, a man who for now we will just call Ken. Ken was a economics teacher at Harden High School in Harden. And I want to just point out that this is like a place called H-A-W-A-R-D-E-N, and it's in England. So that's I'm, I'm going to guess it's called Harden High School, uh, but he actually lived about 10 miles to the southeast of of there in an old historical brick building, which was called Meadow Cottage, which was in the tiny little village of Doddleston. And at the time, in the fall of 1984, he was in the middle of restoring the building for the winter. Uh, So, you know, a historical cottage. So he's, you know, every once in a while, you got to strip it down, fix it up, make sure it's up to code, etc. And uh, at this point in time, uh, it's fall. Uh, So the work is almost already done because he's got to be ready for the winter because it gets cold. And it was kind of an austere place, very empty, blank walls, uh, some exposed red brick pillars around. Uh, But that didn't mean diddly to Ken uh, or either of his two housemates, uh, one of which being his girlfriend, Debbie, uh, and the other being an English teaching colleague of his called Nicola, who was currently sleeping in the spare room slash band rehearsal zone that he had because he was still he was a teacher. He was an economics teacher, but he was still like a pretty young dude. He liked to hang out and play music with the buds. Uh, And Nicola was staying with them because she was Debbie's friend and she had just gotten back from three months teaching abroad in Africa. Uh, So she was just looking for a place to crash for a little bit. And she was kind of just like couch surfing. Um, So that's that's. uh, that's how they how she comes to the picture. Um, and it was probably really quiet and quaint and beautiful in this house at this time. Uh, but uh, that didn't last for long because that August, just as they were getting ready to get the house painted, came the first of many strange occurrences that would come to dominate the lives of these people and more for literally years to come. OK, at first, things started slow, like you might expect with a story with this type of setup Uh, on one of the newly blank walls on the far end of the house by the bathroom. Nobody noticed exactly when, uh, but a strange set of size five footprints appeared looking like whatever left them there just sort of like walked straight up the wall, uh, as it were. Uh, But it was weird because they weren't like shoe footprints. They were like feet. Their feet. Feet oh, footprints. Interesting. And also, more importantly, the it looked kind. like maybe it had a sixth toe. So what? just something just to, like just regularly to, or like on the heel of the foot. I don't think it was a heel of the foot type on of deal. The heel? Damn, that been, no. Yeah, that'd be so no. cool. Think about that. Like an extra toe back there. No, then that would explain. be like, oh, that's some sort of ape creature. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, like, no, it's uh, like a Warcraft t- troll. It's like if you had two big toes, like one on each side kind of vibes. Gotcha. Uh, But uh, they weren't really well defined enough to be something that's like super freaky. Just something that they kind of saw and noted and they were just sort of like, huh, that's weird. And then he decided, well, I got got to paint him anyway. He's got to paint the wall. So he decided paint him, move on with his life uh, until uh, you guys want to guess what happened next. With this Somebody. story, uh, <laughs> no, they, they just they came back. to see. Foot, okay. <laughs> they started <laughs> to see footprints on the ceiling. Yes, footprints came back even clearer this time. Identically shaped marks, exact same weird six-toed foot, exact same spot on the wall, but like fresh now, like as if almost like you know when like a cat knocks over a bucket of paint and then runs sure. over some shit with it. That's uh, that that was the vibe now. Uh, 
And then he painted over them again. And the second time they didn't come back. So that was put to bed. But if you think that means nothing else weird happened to these people, you would be wrong about that. Because as time went on, footprints didn't show up anywhere else. Uh, And for a second, Ken and Debbie and Nicola thought they'd finally be able to relax and enjoy their winter cottage life. But then whatever was happening in their cabin seemed to like almost like turn it up a notch. And pretty soon we started getting into the territory of what most people would call like poltergeist activity, right? Pepsi bottles, cups, chairs, little bits and bobs from around the kitchen started to like arrange themselves into little pyramids stacked Uh, all over the house and places. The things like, okay, yeah, that's, that's very, very classic poltergeist. Yeah. Always while nobody's looking. Uh, and, uh, as I said before, uh, Ken is like a band dude. So people would come in and out from here, you know, from time to time. And so his first reaction wasn't like, oh, fuck, there's ghosts. His first reaction was just like, oh, man, somebody's probably fucking with me. Right. Uh, Just because that's the type of friends he had. And, he, you know, that's like the type, you know, some like Occam's razor type shit. Uh, So he didn't even really consider that the footprints and the stacking could be connected originally. Instead, he was just like. Just my pals mess with me, you know, all good. No big deal. <laughs> yeah. Just my buds. A normal well, reaction. I would be annoyed if somebody did this to me in my house, especially <sighs> if they came over to play music and like stacked my furniture against the wall. But that's neither here nor there. I don't know why he had never confronted them about this. Uh, but that that oh well vibe didn't last very long because pretty soon as the items started to get larger and the stack started getting more and more ambitious and bizarre like the one in out of this world was like straight out of poltergeist the movie like things balancing impossibly precariously i don't know how true that was but that's what it looks like in the show uh and so ken got to the point now where every night he was constantly getting up to check and see if his doors were locked because in his mind if he's wrong and these weren't his friends that were doing this yeah, somebody's breaking. Yeah, his only in. other conceivable thought is somebody's fucking with me. Like somebody's like doing some weird shit, like stalker shit behavior to me. And the idea that this is happening while they're just like nipping out for like a drink at the pub and coming back and somebody's like going in and like doing these weird calculated things was sort of like vibing him out in a bad way. And he was worried that maybe he was going to get robbed or somebody was going to get hurt next. Uh, but nevertheless, life did go on for the three haunted roommates uh, and slowly but surely the house became a home. They got it painted. They put nice little things up all around and settled into a rhythm with the whole situation with the stacking, which never abated, never, ever, ever. And eventually it just sort of became a thing that was like a weird annoyance to them that like they just dealt with it. They thought of it as inconvenient. Nobody was like, what is causing this anymore? It just became right part of daily life for them, which is really, really weird. And the people at Meadow Cottage, despite everything, were sort of able to focus inward on themselves again. And while Ken kept busy teaching, Nicola was starting to get a little disillusioned with her life. And she and Debbie started to get the bug for some more like creative theatrical pursuits. Uh, Mentioned various times that they wanted to write comedy sketches specifically, which is interesting. And so since Ken was a good boyfriend and a good roommate, Every Friday when he got off work, what he would do is he would go to his school's like tech pool, lab center, whatever, check out a 1982 BBC Model B microcomputer, which is like early micro personal computer type computer. And he would set it up in his kitchen for the girls to work on at the table. Right. Uh, And just in case you're one of those people uh, like me who can't really imagine what a computer was like in 1984. Before we go any further, I'm just going to give you a quick rundown on this baby uh, for, you know, yeah, just, with the specs. Yeah. So this thing was like a big beige box with a black monitor with the green text kind of vibe, like one Classic. color and the color is green. It ran on 32 kilobytes of RAM. Wow. It had a two Holy crap. megahertz CPU <laughs> and it had a huge drive on the side that was about as big as the monitor for reading like the big giant square like cheese slice floppy, floppy disks. disk like the big boys yeah yeah uh, the big big boys and they could hold 160 kbs a piece and even though that sounds All like that nothing storage even though that sounds like nothing it actually was helpful because another thing about the bbc microcomputer model b was that the computer had zero onboard memory 
and it would completely wipe itself of all data any time it turned off unless you had it saved on a disk. So this actually becomes important later in the story to uh, to what goes on. Uh, Ooh, I'm excited. But most important of all was the main program that they used for their sketch writing and stuff, which was an extremely simplistic word processor that nobody really remembers today, which was called Edward, which is spelled like the name Edward, except the word in Edward so- is spelled W-O-R-D like a word processor. Wow. It's very futuristic. It's very good stuff. Uh, but anyway... We've went all the way now from August to December. They got this computer ritual that they're starting to do every every week where he brings one home. They work on it. It's not the same computer every time, uh, which is another key thing that's important to this. It was a totally different computer most of the time from a rotating pool of computers. Uh, and one day in December, all three of them headed out to chill with their buds because their their neighbors got a VCR and it was like all the rage. So they were like constantly going over there and watching movies and they forgot when they left the house that they left the computer on when they walked out the door. And that night when they returned, uh, something happened, which nobody expected. Uh, they realized their mistake that they'd left the computer on and Ken went to turn it off. But before he hit the switch, he happened to look up at the screen. And when he did, he noticed something really weird because it looked like to Ken, that somebody else had been using Edward while they were gone. And there was some text written on the screen in like weird kidnapper capitalized random letters style. Okay. Uh, And it was saved to the disc that was in there uh, on the floppy drive as a file called KDN. Uh, And Mathis, if you would be so kind as to read this file here. Here we go. N-A-D-M. All right, here we go. Ken, Debbie, Nick, true are the nightmares of a person that fears. Safe are the bodies of the silent world. Turn pretty flowers, turn towards the sun, for you shall grow and sow, but the flower reaches too high and withers. In the burning light, get out your bricks, pussycat, pussycat, went to London to seek fame and fortune. Faith must not be lost, for this shall be your redeemer. Which sounds like gobbledygook altogether. Yeah, I'm going to be real. In the context of the rest of what happens here, I'm not that clear on what this stuff might mean directly since it's pretty cryptic. But I guess there's always the possibility that some of these things might be slightly misquoted from the book uh, because I've never seen the book myself. But I doubt that's what's going on here. I think it's just very sort of vague compared to a lot of the other stuff that happens. Uh, But unfortunately... After this happened, they were like, what? But it was just too close to Christmas. And Nicola went home for the holidays and they just kind of brushed it to the side for a while. Forgot about it for a few months until February when the still regular instances of stacked kitchen items. This is happening every couple days. uh, They start to realize that it's starting to sort of center itself around this one big pillar in the kitchen uh, that's made of this old hard red brick. Excavate it. And That's people started to get do. wigged out by that area of the house. Uh, and work was starting to get pretty stressful at school. And the same thing happened again, where Ken both brought home the BBC computer to the kitchen, and all three of them went out to hang out with friends. And again, when they got back, there was another disc in the drive. And this time Ooh. the file was called REIT in all caps R E A T E. Uh, and this one I would love for Jesse. To read for me. Why you gotta give me the weird one? <laughs> one Everybody's gonna be reading weird ones. Trust me. Oh. Of course, of course, of <laughs> course. Oh my god. <laughs> I write spelled W R Y T E. A lot of this is spelled incorrectly in all caps. I write on behalf of Man Manye or maybe Manny. Who knows? M A N Y E. Yeah. What strange words thou speak. Although I must confess that I hath also been ill schooled, sometimes methinks altercations are somewhat barful, for they break manye many a sleeps in mine bed. Thou art goodly man who hath fanciful woman who dwell in mine home. I hath no want to affray. For on lay, on lie, scythe mine half-witted antic has ripped a twain mine bound, hath I been reft at night. I have seen 
many, I assume this has to be many, altercations. Yeah. Lastly, charged house and thy home. Tis a fitting place with lights which devil maketh and costly things that only my, uh, mine friend Edmund Gray can afford for the king himself. Twas a great crime to have bribed mine house. LW. Yeah. Pretty wild huh. stuff. Uh, and suddenly, just like that, everybody started paying the fuck attention. Uh, here's a quote uh, from Ken, which I'll just read myself, which said, whatever it meant, whatever Debbie or Nick felt about it, it sang to me. It wasn't a coldness or dark apprehensiveness on this occasion. After the initial shock, I became absorbed by it. Now, Ken started going around showing the message to everyone that he knew, taking it around to his school, seeing if anybody had anything to add. And as it turned out, one of his fellow, fellow teachers, a guy whose name was Peter Trinder, uh, was interested. And at first... He straight up asked Ken if it was all fake or not because he didn't want to waste his time. It was all just some weird hoax joke thing Uh, because as it turned out, he found the writing really interesting and he got a big old copy of the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, and he cross checked a bunch of the weird words and phrases and language before he concluded that what they were looking at was a fairly authentic to the style and phrasing uh, of uh, early modern English sort of writing. And that he would try and use what he had to pinpoint it even further. So they're like, this is some early modern English this guy's writing to you in. It's not perfect. There's still some weirdness about it. But you kind of have to expect that from a real world sample a little bit. Um, And uh, a little while later, Ken and Debbie were having trouble deciding what to do. And whether or not he should like play along with the message or not. Like entertain it as if it's real. So he invited his other friend over, whose name was John, and together they all came up with a response to the message, which they saved on another disc and then just sort of like left on the screen while they went out for the night. Uh, So here's what they left on the screen. uh, And this is for Mathis to read. Thanks. I love that. I'm the normal, the normal language. Yeah, well, we'll see. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) we'll see where we're in the reign of Queen uh, Elizabeth II. Dear LW, thank you for your message. We are sorry for disturbing you. What would you like us to do? Did you live in a house on this land about 1620? Do you want us to tell you more about our time? Why write a poem? Who is Edmund Gray? Is he related to the uh, Edgerton family? Do you have a family? Is the King James or Charles or Charles Stewart? Is the King James? Is the King James? Yeah, yeah, my bad. Yeah. Well, what is the charge house? Was this village called Doddleston in your life? And how many families lived here? Thank you very much for your messages. Thank you for not making us afraid. Ken, Debbie, and John. And uh, pretty quickly, we got a little response from LW. uh, And this one's for Jesse to read. Twas an honest farm of oak and stone. It is helpful that you should tell me about thy time. Dost thou have horse? Edmund Gray, brother of John Gray, lives at Kinnertone Hall. The king, of course, is Henry VIII, who is six and forty. A new, a new what of King James. Mine charge house is a place of lore. L W twenty eighth March anno fifteen twenty one. See, this is interesting to me because I think we even brought it up before. The idea that hauntings might not be hauntings and that they might be like a collision of time. Yes. And that you think something is a ghost, but that they, that means they on the other side are having weird messages and weird things. And they might think it's like something else. Yes. Uh, there's um the, the, I forget what the name of the famous ship is. It's, a, it's a, like the Mary something. Mary, Mary Celeste. Mary. Yeah, it might, it might be. It's a famous haunted ship. And that was another theory that people had brought up is that because they had a, a, a recorded encounter of what was a ghost, but it, the the voice on the other side, side sounded confused, like "Hello, who's there?" And it almost sounded like maybe they were they talking, were doing their own yeah. thing and they were talking back. Yeah, very very interesting stuff. That's the stuff that's really interesting to me. Uh, right. And basically, now they sort of had this back and forth going on. Uh, but the problem was, this LW guy seemed to have a lot of his most basic facts wrong. Like he got the king's age oh. wrong for the year, uh, and Kinnerton Hall was being mentioned a hundred years too early. And there's no record of any John Gray living there uh, or his brother Edmund. 
And Ken was just sort of stuck between his feeling that this was real because it's such an inexplicable thing to to witness. And the thought that maybe somebody is doing this to him and like weirdly bullying him. And now it's getting like super crazy. If you can like imagine this happening to you and you not knowing why it's happening, it's probably feels pretty weird because it's such a strange thing. Uh, but this did not deter him. And now at this point, Ken is literally just borrowing this computer, like a different computer. And again, every time you turn it off, it wipes its memory. Uh, so he's borrowing computer after computer every week, just for the express purpose of exchanging messages with LW Nicola and Debbie out the window. Nicola just kind of fades out of the story uh, eventually. Uh, but now they're going back and forth, swapping details about each other's lives. Uh, LW sends him like a recipe for some cheeses. He tells him about his dead wife that he had. Uh, and if you didn't pick it up already from when he referred to the house as mine house, he was just as disturbed about what was going on as Ken and Debbie were, except it was his house that it was happening to. And so what they sort of pieced together was that they were both sort of occupying the same space and that the computer was almost like present in his uh in his world there he's getting like letters in the same (laughs) on the other side in the same place that it is in 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 uh ken's house uh but i'm gonna go a little bit off my script here because i learned this a little bit later down the line but something that they don't mention till much later in the story is that on lw side he's not really manipulating the computer he's just sort of like thinking towards it and it's doing what he wants uh is something that they sort of establish and there'll be a little bit more justification for that later in the story. But like, just because I know that's probably something that's like sort of niggling at your mind a little bit, like he's in his experience of this, he can think to the computer and he can also bring other people to the computer to think to the computer. Uh, so that's it's weird. See, I imagine it would have been like, he's getting mysterious, like writings on a letter and then he would write back. Yeah. Uh, And meanwhile, they're also testing a lot more of these facts and figures that LW would share in his messages to cross check with anything they can dig up, uh, even though at first he was super wrong. And while a lot of the stuff was helpful, uh, we go back to Peter Trinder, the OED guy uh, who begins to think he recognizes LW's accent as something from the West Country. And he requests that in his next message to him that Ken mention Bristol. Uh, you know, the the place in England. Uh, and when LW wrote back, LW said he actually was from Bristol and that his name was not just LW. It was Lucas with a K, Wayneman, Lucas Wayneman, uh, which they immediately jumped on as a great way of finding out whether or not he was real. Uh, because now they had his name and there was still the matter of all these historical inconsistencies and some of the words used. Uh, And while a lot of them were technically correct, they're starting to find sometimes he's off by using a word that's like 100 years old or 200 years old. Interesting. Uh, It's, you know, still something that would exist at that time that maybe he could draw from. I do this all the time in my like weird way of talking is if anybody who knows me who texts me. Right. Like I definitely talk in a weird way uh, sometimes, but like it, it didn't feel super good. But according to Peter Trinder. And all the research that he did, he still maintained that for someone to go through as much trouble as they would have to to do this, even as accurately as they were doing and also responding to the questions in the things that that uh, Ken was asking, it would take too long. Like you can't go out for an hour and come back and have like a perfectly researched 16th century piece of writing, because, again, it's 84. There's no Internet. There's no way to, like, get examples at hand quickly and do this. Uh And, you know, that's just sort of the thing that he was sort of using as his sort of evidence that this was something worth thinking about. Uh, And they were also having a lot of trouble with the names, because obviously a lot of a lot of people that you mentioned might not be important enough to make it into a book at this time because it's the 16th century. Um, But for so many people to be fake, even big rich people like Edmund Gray didn't bode too well. Uh, But rather than decide it was some sort of hoax right away, uh, these messages coupled with the still regular stacking of objects, which is still happening this whole time and is now getting so disturbing to Ken and Debbie that they literally started renting out another house that was cheaper so they could sleep somewhere quiet without having to worry about somebody like 
sneaking in and fucking with their house or whatever the hell was yeah. going on. <clears throat> uh, Safety concerns. Yeah. But Ken and Lucas just kept writing back and forth to each other. Slowly, they kind of have a relationship that they build. They become more like friends style relationship. And while Ken and Debbie were still going through all their own shit over this insane situation, uh, on Lucas's side of things, it's going very similarly. And he also wrote about how his servant would always come ask him if he's okay because he's worried that he's acting crazy and that he made Ken and Debbie up and that there's some kind of weird, like imaginary friend flight of fancy that he's got because apparently only Lucas could see the computer, but he could like teach people how to use it and how to think huh. towards it. Um, and uh, as Peter kept confirming and translating a lot of the language, Ken and Debbie kind of started to drink the Kool-Aid a little bit more uh, and especially uh, messages uh, as they started to come more and more frequently, like sometimes like a couple times back and forth really quickly, it started to break down the idea that somebody was elaborately going through some sort of process to hoax them. It started to become too unbelievable that somebody could do this in real life for them. And they were starting to just believe, you know what, like this is, you know, whatever we're doing here, we're just going to assume we're talking to some fucking 16th century people. Uh, and then things start becoming a little more complex. The mechanics of what's going on after talking a little bit about modern technology with Lucas and more specifically the idea of cars, Ken decided to do an experiment where he took a clipping of a Jaguar XJ coupe from a magazine and left it on the keyboard. Uh, and, and when he left and when he came back this time, there was a message that confirmed his theory that he was actually able to like see the, see the clipping. And here's, here's what he said about it. Oh. This is for Jesse to read. Mine goodly friend, I hath found thy cart portraying, but tis a crude thing for without mine horse, it shall, it shall not go f gone far. Yeah. So, <laughs> Basically, Lucas is just talking shit on his car, saying that it doesn't He's look like, like that's not going to go anywhere without a horse, you nerd. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and basically, yeah, <laughs> it seemed like they realized that they could leave things close enough to the computer that Lucas could see and interact with them. And when Ken came back to look at it again with the response message, the photo uh, of the of the car that he pulled from the magazine had gotten like brittle and crispy around the edges. Uh and after sharing a few more weird recipes for things and stuff and like basically like doing DMs with each other, they were <laughs> able to get a few more key pieces of information out of him. Basically that he studied somewhere in Oxford called Jesus College. Uh, he got they got the names of a bunch of books and stuff that he'd studied and read some quotes of Latin, the name of the local sheriff, which they could all reference. Um, and also the messages started coming at times that would be much riskier for a hoaxer to leave them like at times when people were at home sleeping instead of out for the night. Right. So if it really was somebody just messing around, they were starting to get pretty bold. And at this time they started to hear new footsteps uh, on the kitchen roof. Uh, and every time they went to go look and see what they were, they could never find anything about it, but it started to be a real, real deal. Uh, you know, that was really starting to freak them out. But then Peter came back with more information and he was saying, <clears throat> most of the stuff that Lucas was saying was impossible or unbelievable because of how inaccurate it was. Jesus college wasn't founded until 30 years after Lucas said he went there. Uh, his supposed Latin he claimed to have learned was kind of crappy sort of piddling Latin. Uh, but rather than give up the game right away, Ken and Peter decided it would be more beneficial to lead him on a bit because if this was somebody who was fake, you know, they were just trying to, tease it out and see if they could figure it out. But surprisingly at this point, it was actually Lucas who called them out. Uh, <laughs> and Jesse, here's another quote uh, from Lucas uh, though, for clarity's sake. Now we're going to start using Peter's translations of what he was saying so that you can like actually comprehend them. Great. Uh, so here we go. My friend, pray <laughs> what strange demon are you? 
I'm so confused. You are goodly, I feel, but your lies frighten me much. You said you are alive, but this is not so. I have no wish to accuse you, but you said also that you are an educated man and that you know of my friend Erasmus, but you do not mention my misspelt words. If you were alive, you would say you know not of Jesus College. It is not uh, I that make you afraid. It is you that makes me afraid. Yeah. So the, the whole time he's like trying to do the same thing to them yeah. being like, oh, yeah. So turn, fake yeah. Info. Lucas has been testing them and he's been trying to catch them out. And Ken has been doing the same thing to Lucas and giving them. And he, so he's saying he's been giving him fake facts to see if he'll play along with it or not, to see if he's actually somebody from the world who can check facts. Right. Uh, and because you got to imagine if it's 1520, for all Lucas knows, Ken is like a demon or a devil from hell who's trying to corrupt him. So it's funny you say that because in my mind, I'm like, well, what? Because they're getting weird footprints with six toes. What if it's some weird other entity f- fucking with them and just not knowing his own information? That is a very interesting idea. Turned out Lucas actually, <laughs> actually, according to Lucas, he actually studied at a place called Brazenose College. Uh, and that was some real information under his belt. Peter suggested Ken bring in a group called the SPR, or you might recognize them as the Society for Psychical Research. Uh, yeah. Oh, we brought them yeah. up uh, What last episode. Yeah, they've been around since at least Victorian times. They look into catalog and possibly debunk all sorts of strange paranormal stuff uh, by <clears> looking <throat> at it through a scientific lens, uh, which was just as well because it, you know, we also have all this ghost stuff going on. And then Debbie starts to have some crazy things happen to her. And here's actually a quote from Debbie about some particularly creepy stuff that happened around this time. And this is from Mathis uh, to read here. I'll just give it to you to read. Oh, did we not? <laughs> I heard. Boop. What did I do wrong here? Oh, it might be too big. Is that possible? Oh, yeah, it could be. Here, I'll, you have me on Discord, right? I'll put you, I put on Twitter for you. All right, that works too. All right, here we go. Uh, as soon as it loads, there we go. All right. On this night, the disturbance manifested itself as small tapping noises on the door to the kitchen, which I kept bolted when I was alone. It made me edgy, but I put some music on and they seemed to disappear. When all was quiet, I took a look under, uh, under the the four into the kitchen to check if the coast was clear in the hope that I could go and make a coffee. Sure. That all seemed clear. I put the main light on brazenly barged into the kitchen and made a drink. No problem. I came back into the the lounge and sat down with the coffee. At that instant, I felt a prickly coldness against my left side of the of my face and neck and something pulled at my hair. I thought it was my collar at first until it persisted another four times when I when uh, then stopped. It happened so quickly, I wasn't sure what to think until a few seconds later, I felt a slight pressure gripping my shoulder. That was unbearable. I knew someone was to the left of me, but could not see at the corner of my eye. I turned around and nothing was there. I ran outside the house and waited for Ken to return. The cold, damp rain didn't bother me as much as the house. Yeah. Uh, And it's about this time in the episode of Out of This World that I was watching. And it's actually a two-parter, so you have to catch the end of one episode and then they follow like unsolved mystery style. Sure, uh, sure. And I, it seems like they take some pretty extreme license with the story at this point. In the summary that I have that covers this part of the story, uh, which only one summary really does, it simply says that Debbie starts to obsess over Lucas so much in her daily life that she begins having dreams about him. That's all it says. Huh. But in the TV show, not only does she dream about him, but she like dreams that she travels back to be with him in his own time and that oh, they no. like bear oh, their no. souls to each other and like kiss and stuff. Oh my God. She has, she's living her own fanfic in her head. Like I did with my anime waifus as a teenager. Yeah. Uh, now, like I said, I yeah, haven't no. read, mm. I haven't read that. It's the same thing. Book. It's the same thing, Jesse. Don't, don't me hang on. Alex this is important. Yeah. It's the same thing. Al- uh, Jesse. Uh, no, it is. You know what? You're right. It's sad in both cases. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You may continue. Here's Alex. the thing. Yeah, right. I haven't You're read right. the book, right. so I don't know how true it is. But in the show also, when he's talking, when Lucas is talking to Ken again later, he's like, I saw your wife. She is so beautiful. Like it is like <sighs> it is like part of this story in the in the show, at least that huh. she like dreamed that she met him. And then he says that he met her uh, and they kissed. Uh, but I don't know if it's real. <laughs> 
Uh, but either way, the next morning when she woke up from whatever she was actually dreaming about, uh, near that exposed brick pillar that I was talking about earlier, where everything was sort of like starting to coalesce around, uh, they found Lucas had written his name on the floor in chalk. And this freaked Debbie out so much that she basically stopped sleeping at that house altogether and and just stayed at the other rental place pretty much full time. Uh, and now the SPR are here to investigate everything. Maybe they're going to kind of settle this once and for all. Everybody's really excited. And the first thing they do is they ask Ken and Debbie to have family members over to stay with them who can like track their activities and be with them the whole time they're there and swear affidavits to their not writing the notes themselves. So they do that. Uh, and Debbie's brother and her mom come by and stay for the whole weekend and they set up the computer and they leave it in the kitchen and Ken goes out to drink and Debbie and her family chill in the living room together for the whole time. Uh, and uh, here's a quote from Debbie's mom about that time uh, uh, for Jesse to read. So I'm going to just drop that here in the chat for you. Oh, I can't. It's too big. Oh, so you got to go to Twitter. <laughs> to Twitter. Whoa. Easy peasy. This is the, the mother-in-law? Yeah. This is Debbie's mom. Oh, all right. My son and I. Are she British? She's got to be. My, my son and I arrived <laughs> at Meadow Cottage at approximately 7.45 p.m. on the 15th of April 1985. A few minutes later, a friend of Mr. Webster is called at the front door for something. After a few words were exchanged between my daughter and the caller, we left. Uh, he left and we three, my daughter Debbie, my son and myself, went into the kitchen. We checked the windows and the doors in the kitchen and bathroom. The back door was locked with a chain on the inside. The windows were closed, including the skylights, though we did not have time to check if they were locked. Uh, we then gave our attention to the computer. All previous entries on the disc were inspected. Debbie typed a few lines on the screen. As far as we knew, there was nothing entered after that. I felt cold at times and at one stage was shivering. We all kept our coats on as there was no fire on the hearth. We went to the kitchen again at 9 p.m. and we saw a new entry displayed, starting with a poem. We were short on time and I was unable to understand all that was entered at the time, but did manage to read and understand one or two lines. We then left the cottage. So even with family witnesses there, they were able to produce the effect of the writing <laughs> appearing on the screen. Nobody coming into the house, nothing going on. And then after they had family members do it, because I know you're thinking, well, the mom could be in on it. Just to prove true, there was true. no family funny business. Next, they get a man called Frank Davies, who's just the mechanics teacher at Ken's high school that he teaches at to come and be an even more impartial witness. And here is what he saw. And this is going to be for Mathis to read. And this time right. it's going to let me put it in the chat because it's not as long of a little thing. Excellent. <clears throat> At 8 p.m., a noticeable drop in temperature occurred, which lasted some two or three minutes. The coldness did not seem to be due to any air movement, though there must have been some as the fire was burning gently in the grate. After a few minutes, the room temperature became comfortably normal again. On returning to the kitchen, we observed a new message on the computer. The message was from someone calling themselves John, and it told us that the sheriff had put Lucas in prison, apparently for communicating with us. Debbie appeared genuinely concerned at this turn of events. Yeah. And so that's happened. And meanwhile, all this time, that guy, Peter Trinder, who has been hitting the books down at Brazenose College, where Lucas said he went, trying to... F trying his best to find anything he can about Lucas Wayneman. And he's, and he's coming up totally empty handed and frustrated over and over. No record of anybody ever attending the school with that name. Uh, but then a couple of weeks before this in a communication on April 4th, where basically Lucas is also letting a friend of his include a message on the BBC for Ken and Debbie. Uh, one sentence blows the whole thing wide open. And I'm just going to read it myself because it's that much of a twist. The fashion of our time is such that I will not give my own name, nor Lucas's true description and name. And if that's true, then that means that once again, 
They were looking for the wrong thing in the wrong place because Lucas isn't really this dude's name. It's just they all give fake names because they don't know. They don't want to tell anybody. They're afraid of they're talking to a demon yeah. or something like that. Because if you have your if you have their name, it's bad. You know, right. So now look at where all these people have found themselves. Not only do they have no idea who Lucas really is anymore, but whoever he is, he's also apparently just been arrested by the sheriff for communicating with evil spirits. And so then Ken gets back in contact with this dude, John, who told him about the sheriff thing. Uh, and, t- and, and he makes it, he, he tells the sheriff, let Lucas come use the box again. And Lucas will show you how he sends messages all the way to 1985. Right. He's like, go tell the sheriff that. And so the sheriff says, all right, oh, lady, baby. Boom, 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 boom. so Lucas <laughs> comes back and in the message that he writes back, he drops the next bombshell. Uh, and this one I'm keeping in old timey speak. And that's for Jesse to read. It's just one little sentence. Here you go. Y'all, I guess this is you, but yeah. y'all said your time be 1985. Me thought y'all were alls from 2109. Like your friend whom didst bring limbs boist prey? Yeah. So just in case you didn't understand that, let me lay it out for you. Lucas, when he hears they're in the year 1985, is actually surprised to hear that they're from the year 1985 because apparently he is also talking and has been from the beginning to someone from the year 2109, 2109. And he just assumed that that's when Ken and Debbie were from, too, and that they also knew this third person. Right. Huh. So that is an interesting development. And so Ken faced with no other option because almost nobody believes him decides to write a message, which he titled on the disc as calling 2109. <laughs> uh, and sure enough, he gets a response. Oh, my God. Which math is <laughs> happening right now? I'm, I'm, I'm like all in on this. So I'm prepped for disappointment yeah. at the end when you tell me how this was all fake. Get ready. All right. Here we go. Okay. Ken, Deb, Peter, we are sorry that we can give you only two choices. One, that you either have your predicament explained in such a non-rhyme way that you may have instant understanding, but cause what should not, uh, what should not be, but cause what should not be to happen. Or two, try to understand that you three have a purpose that you shall in your lifetime change the face of history. We 2109 must not affect your thoughts directly but give you some sort of guidance that will allow room for your own destiny. All we can say is that we are part of the same God, whatever he it is. And that is the surprise end of the Doddleston messages. Part one. Oh, we're going to get a part two. That's right. It's another part all about 2109. More from that next time, the end of this insane story next time. And so I implore you to do yourselves a favor. This is fascinating. How this is da- fascinating. How dare I will not you touch do it. this to us. I'm, 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 you know what, Alex? <laughs> I knew I brought you into this business for a yes. reason. Uh, <laughs> Please. Can I just, going into this, I, before we go, you yes. know, end this episode and stuff, what's fascinating to me is if this, you know, obviously you throw with a grain of salt, all this is true. You just assume all this is true. Does that mean like time is a loop and that time, like there is fate and there is like a I predetermined think you're way kind of off. I think there's going to be a dude living in the house, like in <laughs> like a guy in the house. I, I, and I when it, and then he's going to be, and he's just messing with them. And he's like, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's going to be a payoff where it's like his name was John George. And he lived <laughs> in the, he lived in that pillar. He lived in that <laughs> pillar and he stood still <laughs> for 12 hours a day, every day while he That's was awake. What I'm telling you. Uh, yes. I mean, I, I'm I'm assuming it's going to go more in that direction, but saying like just making the fun assumption, hypothetically, this is true. It just throws in a question time itself and and all that. The fact that that's how broad our possible explanations are for what's going on here and that I know the answer already uh, is very exciting to me. But it also makes me want to implore you, if you're a good listener of Chiluminati, to not Google this until next week. Please don't look up how the story resolves, because I promise, I promise, promise, promise that it's going to have at least a few more surprises in it for you. It's a very fascinating story. And uh, I've, I can't wait to share with you the rest of what happens. This, this might be your best cliffhanger yet. It's a pretty Alex. good one. This, I'm always working hard to good. get those cliffhangers, right? 
It's pretty damn good. Well, on that, we have to go do a mini-sode for Patreon. So if you want to hear any more of us babbling immediately after this, so head over to patreon.com <laughs> slash Pod. <laughs> so um, upset. That's it for us. Oh, if, and if you've been enjoying that, please leave us a review. Uh, it goes a long way to helping out the podcast, just reaching other people's ears. Um, which we continue to do because for some reason people keep enjoying this stuff. For some reason. So it uh, goes a long, long way. Uh, that's it for us. We will see you all next week. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye. Patreon.com slash Illuminati Pod. Goodbye. Anyway, me and my wife were sitting outside indulging on our porch one night, enjoying ourselves. I needed to go to the bathroom, so I stepped back inside, and after a few moments, I hear my wife go, Holy shit, get out of here. So I quickly dash back outside, and she's looking up at the sky in awe. I look up too, and there's a perfect line of dozen lights traveling across the sky. Now that we're coming up on a year of this quote unquote new normal, it sometimes feels like we'll never get our old lives back. The uncertainty of not knowing what this will end is frustrating and let's be honest with ourselves, just a little scary. I miss my old routines and I really miss being able to see my friends and family whenever I want. I'm pretty sure the delivery guy for my food is thinking that he's my best friend. Every time he knocks on the door, I just pour my heart out to him. And now more than ever, Therapy is a way to find our way out when things feel especially dark. Just talking through my fears and anxiety makes me breathe easier and feel hope again. And not, not with the food delivery guy, with, with my therapist. That's why I wholeheartedly recommend Talkspace for therapy. You can sign up online and start therapy the same day as you sign up. You can text, video, or send voice messages to your licensed therapist. So it's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions for the comfort of your home. And for me, therapy has truly gotten me through some of the hardest parts of the past year. Moreover, it's affordable. Talkspace is a fraction of the cost of in-person therapy. And instead of waiting for an appointment, you can send unlimited messages to your th therapist 24 seven, and they'll engage with you daily, five days a week. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get hundred dollars off your first month with Talkspace. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com or download the app. Make sure you use the code CHILL, though, to get $100 off of your first month and showing your support for the show. That's CHILL at Talkspace.com. CHILL. Again, code CHILL, C-H-I-L-L, -L, at Talkspace.com.